Hi everyone, welcome to another Mind the Bleep Careers Talk. Um, we've just got Christian Grimes today who is a core trainee with a job in ENT and we've also got Rowanna who is a new F1 interested in surgery. So um, take it away guys. Um, I'll just put the links for the feedback in the chat at the end and don't forget to fill those out because you'll get your certificates of attendance via that route and just ask any questions you want in the chat and we'll ask at the end. Brilliant. Hello everyone. Um... Thank you, Frankie, for introducing me and Rowanna. Um, so I'm a core surgical trainee with an ENT themed job, and I thought I wanted to do ENT roughly since final year um, and sort of have learned along the way, asked a lot of people about how to get into it and um, made a couple of mistakes along the way as well and have ended up with, a, with my dream job, an ENT themed job in core surgical training, and will be looking into applying for ST3 in ENT at the end of this year. Rana, would you like to also introduce yourself and, uh, as well, if you'd like? Hi everyone, yeah, I'm uh, Rowanna, and I've just started as an F1 in the pool. Um, I first became interested in ENT, sort of halfway through medical school, um, and kind of hoping to apply um, to be in Christian's position in a few years' time. So, um, yeah, that's where I'm at at the moment. And hopefully it's sort of up from here. A wise decision, Rowanna. Well done. You can't go wrong. <laughs> OK, I'm going to load up the presentation, uh, which we've done before. Um, but I'm also going to start a poll. We want to get an idea of where you guys are all from so that we can uh, adjust the presentation appropriately. Because if you're all core trainees, that's going to be different to if you're all medical students. Uh, and this will help us um, direct the questions and answers specifically to you guys. So I'm going to try this. I've never used Mendel before, but I have um, created a poll. You may be able to see it. You may not. I don't know. Um, but hopefully something has flown up onto your screen under polls. And we'll just start to get a bit of an idea of where you guys are all from. I'm going to give you a second to do that, uh, because once I load up the presentation, I can't see it very easily. Um, and then we'll crack on. Now, I, can't, I don't think there's too many of you at the moment, but in total, we're going to have about 50 of us, which is amazing. A lot of interest in ENT. But what we're seeing already is that the majority are either foundation doctors uh, or medical students. And I'm not sure if the one CT is me that I because I, I put that down or whether there's I don't know whether I represent 11 percent or not. But but by far, most of you are foundation doctors and then secondly, medical students. Great. So this talk is perfect for you guys. If you're all telling me that you're sort of specialty doctors or something, um, I don't think I'm going to be able to add much, but we should do with you lot. So let me share my screen. And we're going to crack on. OK. Uh, Rowanna, can you just let me know if you can see the slides so I know if everyone else can see Yeah, them. yeah, I can see them. Brilliant. Okay, so um, a core surgical trainee's guide to getting into ENT. My name is Christian Grimes, as I've already said. We've got Rowanna with us. And I also wanted to mention one of my consultants, uh, Mr. David Alderson. He's a consultant ENT surgeon in Torbay Hospital, where I've been working for the last year. And he's had a look through and vetted this presentation as well. I'd also like to thank Mind the Bleep for giving me the opportunity to do this talk with Rowanna. Um, and I'd also like to um, thank the SFO UK. OK, so this is point number one, learning point number one, guys. Join the SFO UK and also, of course, join Mind the Bleep if you haven't already. Why join SFO UK? Well, it's the student foundation for otolaryngology in the UK. So Rowanna and I are both representatives of this society. And that actually gives us a point in uh, leadership and management at a regional level. So we'll, we'll talk about career and portfolio stuff later, but that's, that's one reason why to join them if you're interested in that, those sorts of career points. Um, but even better than that, they have lots of different topics about how to get into ENT. They're on all the social handles as well, and they inform you about events that are going on. They've got competitions. We'll link back to it later on. But basically, these guys are good to have on your side to be aware of what's going on as a student and as a doctor. I didn't know about them until I was a core trainee, and I feel very much like I was left out at the start. So don't be a Christian and join this early. OK, so what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about careers in ENT. Why bother looking at a career in ENT? That's what you guys want to know. 
I'll have a chat about what it's like being called training in the Southwest. And uh, Rana will have a chat about, uh, actually, she is from the Southwest as well, aren't you, from Exeter. So um, she'll also talk to you about what it's like being a medical student going and thinking about ENT in the Southwest. We'll talk about applications and portfolios as well. E this is even useful as medical students because you even get points, only get points, in fact, if you've done it before medical, uh, before being a doctor. So at medical school. So um, really useful information across the board, gives you an idea of what to aim for, what to apply for, what to start doing, even in your early years um, uh, going forward. And we're also going to talk about plans for FY3 years. OK, that's quite a popular topic. There's a couple of F2s among you that will be useful as well. And then we're going to leave it to the floor for you guys to ask all your questions at the end. OK. OK, so um, we've already talked about this and actually we've got an idea of, of what you guys mostly are. So we're going to move on. So why ENT? Uh, well, let's crack off with a couple of them. Uh, I really enjoyed ENT partly because I felt like I was treating people across the spectrum. OK, you had the very young, you had paediatrics, otolaryngology, um, kids with glue ear, requiring tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy, etc. All the way through to elderly patients with things like head and neck cancers or reconstructive surgery um, and everyone in between. A lot of variety. Uh, it's very hands on. OK, so uh, as a surgical specialty goes, you can do open surgery, you can do endoscopic surgery, you can do robotic surgery, you can do microscopic surgery. Um, so there are loads of different options available. I'll give you an example of each. Open surgery, head and neck dissection. OK, so you get to open up the whole neck, get to see all the lovely anatomy, get stuck in. Really fun as an assistant as well, because you have to get to see what's going on. The other end of the spectrum, endoscopic. OK, we do a lot of surgery in noses. That's all using endoscopes. Very difficult to learn from that sometimes when you're trying to look down a nostril with the surgeon who's got the head in the way. But, but there is, a, obviously with endoscopy, you also have the camera as well, so you get to see things on the screen. That's really enjoyable. Robotics, that's really fun. OK, that's new and coming through, like the Da Vinci machines. So that's really exciting. Um, and ENT is a recognised specialty that uses the robot. You might, do, you might get to use that as well. Um, ENT is often quite a satisfying uh, specialty as well. It's a mixture of surgery and medicine, which is quite um, it's quite satisfying. You do a lot of clinics as well as theatre. And often patients are quite well coming to you um, or you find that you often have a solution for them and often the treatment is curative. So when you think about some specialties like upper GI, uh, where, you know, if you were sort of a pancreas surgeon, for example, and everyone came to you with uh, pancreatic cancer, um, the majority, up to 80 percent, uh, die from pancreatic cancer uh, over a five year period. So, you know, that is very different to the patient that comes to you with their daughter who's got, you know, bilateral glue in. You're going to give them some grommets and make them all better. A couple of things to think about there. You're also the A of the A to E algorithm, which is quite exciting. You're up there with the anaesthetist managing the airway. OK, when a patient does go uh, south, they go south very quickly because, you know, when we think about managing patients from A to E, airway is the most important one. And it's very uh, satisfying, I suppose, one after the initial scary episode to have come in and saved the day helping manage uh, A from A to E algorithm. Something that I think is appealing to a lot of people now as well, it's got a good work-life balance. Uh, I say this in caveats among surgeons. I'm sure my wife would tell me, uh, and you guys as well, that um, uh, we still had to commit a lot of time to you know, the portfolio of surgery and the conferences and the um, teaching sessions and evenings like this, for example. You know, all of this is sort of contributing towards being a surgeon. Um, but along with that, uh, ENT's sort of on-call schedules, for example, are, tend to be non-residential. So if you're the registrar, the consultant, you don't have to be in hospital to be on call. And you're not often called in unless there is an airway emergency. So you can see how that would work with a with a with your work life balance, um, and the day to day ENT as well doesn't tend to be as busy as some of our uh, other surgical colleagues like general surgeons. And my consultant, Mr. Alderson, maybe he's biased, has wanted me to put in as well that uh, why work in ENT. Well, he wanted to work in ENT because he finds the colleagues are are generally quite normal and nice and supportive people. And um, possibly compared to some of the stereotypes that you may see in other surgical specialties. So that's a load of different examples. But Rowana, why don't you um, share your thoughts on that? Just, are any of these representative for you and why you're interested in ENT? Or do you have any other thoughts about you know, what pulled you into to the idea of doing ENT? Uh, yeah, I think the work-life balance was probably the biggest one for me. Um, 
I think it's just because I rotated around quite a few of the surgical specialties and on my week in ENT they just seemed to have a lot more like they were leaving on time there wasn't you get some sort of airway emergencies and things but generally it's a bit more elective surgery um and they all just seemed really happy and really liked their job so that was quite sort of inspiring really um yeah that's the biggest one i'd say i mean it was, it was quite similar reasons that you just said really um i like the variety of patients um which you don't get with a lot of specialties um and yeah i quite like the medical and surgical mixture that comes with it too yeah, absolutely. And um, there's a lot of variety. You can do ears, you can do noses, you can do throat, <laughs> hence the ENT, um, paediatrics, facial plastics. I've listed uh, in red, those are all the different subspecialties that you can choose to go into as a ENT surgeon consultant. Uh, so you have to kind of pick one of those and sort of demonstrate that you're interested to go into one of those subspecialties. So um, a huge wide range. And it's interesting, really. I, I mean, I'm very honoured as part of sort of ENT that um, we've got so many people that want to come to tonight's session because uh, I don't know about all of you guys, but for me, I only had one official week of ENT at medical school. And then I did a taster for a month. But uh, up to that point, I only had one official week in ENT. Verana, what about you? How much ENT did you actually get as a, you know, a standard uh, in, in the Exeter Uni? Yeah, I was really lucky because we do like a one standard week, but then in fifth year you can choose a bit more. Um, so I chose to do six weeks in the in the ENT as part of like my surgical rotation fifth year. So I've actually yeah, I've done seven weeks in total, um, which is more than like anyone else I've heard of doing as a med student. So um, that's been really useful, um, especially because even if you don't end up doing ENT, I think a lot of what you um, learn about on ENT comes in useful in GP and ED. Um, so when I did those rotations, I was sort of a lot more um, confident as well with that. Mm. So, yeah. Very good point. ENT plays a lot in A&E and in GP uh, medical practice. They say up to 25% of GP appointments have an ENT issue. Uh, so that sort of demonstrates how much uh, ENT actually invades into our GP colleagues' specialties. Maybe this is a good point now to touch on um, as a medical student, you know, what, if you're thinking about ENT, but you only get that one standard week in ENT, how could you broaden your experience there? So Rana had a, a brilliant opportunity to be able to pick um, a specialty. If, if you don't get that opportunity, most medical schools should be able to allow you some time to devote to a specialty of interest for a couple of weeks, maybe up to a month. I got a four week allowance, which I could divide as I wished. And I divided it into two weeks in Salisbury Hospital and two weeks at uh, Portsmouth Hospital because I was in the Wessex region from Southampton University. And I had an amazing time there and uh, that really sort of helped consolidate whether ENT was what I wanted to do. Uh, again, medical students, you know, I really worried at medical school what I was going to do. And, I, you know, uh, when we go into becoming a doctor, you know, going to medical school, we had to decide that we wanted to do medicine at the age of 16 for a lot of us. Um, and so we're kind of used to the idea of knowing what we're going to do. And it's quite unsettling when we don't know. So if you don't know what you want to do, uh, my first advice is, do you want to do something with a bit of surgery and yes or no? Do you want to do something that's in hospital or out of medicine or out of hospital? Yes or no? And you can also say if you want to do a bit of both, you know, you can work with that. But if you want to do a bit of surgery, but you also like a bit of medicine, but you want to be a hospital specialty, then seriously consider ENT and think about uh, adding that to some of your, your experience, uh, maybe in final year, if you get the choice. ENT, very friendly. They'll be happy to have you along, certainly. OK, um, so I'm going to talk about the ENT training pathway. So we've talked a little bit about getting a bit of experience in ENT at medical school. Um, and another one as well is join the SFO. They're a medical student and foundation doctor society. Um, you can become the medical rep in your uh, university if you so wish, or you can just sort of uh, tag along and get some interest in, um, and some information from the ENT society. So let's say you're starting to think about ENT. Well, what's the pathway? Well, everyone's going to be going through foundation years one and two. And then depending on what you want to do, you could either go into an FY3 plus. OK, so that's like a a fellowship year or working abroad. I've done both, by the way, so very happy to answer questions on both of those. I've worked in New Zealand and I've worked uh, as an FY3 in medical education as a fellow. Um, and then once you've done that, uh, or not do that, from FY2, you then apply 
for core training. And that's quite interesting. You actually do it quite early. So even if you're day one F1, well done today, getting through your first day is F1, probably all induction stuff and no real medicine, but you're, you're doing great. Um, but if you're day one F1, you know, you've got 18 months now until applications for core training if you want to go straight through. Um, and so you kind of get used to this idea that actually you do have to sort of crack on and get through things because 18 months will go, go by pretty quickly. Not to stress you out, you've still got plenty of time, but, but it's, it's something to bear in mind. You do core training years. I've just finished CT1. I'm about to go into CT2. And I'm also thinking about the fact that I've got to apply for ST3s uh, in November, December this year. So all through the last year, I've been kind of planning and doing stuff to get uh, prepared for that. And then once you get into uh, specialty training in ENT, it's all plain sailing, right? OK, you've got six years in total. It's quite a long process. Um, you, when you apply for something like ENT, because ENT is not in every hospital, what happens is you apply to a region. So let's take my region, for example, Peninsula. And Peninsula's got four hospitals that provide ENT. It's got Torbay, Truro, Exeter and Plymouth. And each year I would rotate around each of those hospitals and then two of them I would rotate around again. OK, so that's something to bear in mind. A couple of areas in the country, like Glasgow and Birmingham, they've got a lot of ENT hospitals and experience in a smaller area. So you don't have to move out of those cities. But in other places like Wessex uh, or Seven Deanery, you, you can tell I've been looking at the ones down the south a bit more. But in all of those, you do have to move around a bit more. So that is something to bear in mind as well. That being said, I have to say the majority of the registrars in Peninsula are female. Um, which hopefully demonstrates that um, that ENT is an accessible specialty for both sexes, as it should be. OK, ST8. Uh, so in ST8, that's the last year until you decide what sort of specialty you want to go into or subspecialty rather. Um, so you may end up doing a fellowship year after ST8 to gain more experience in your interested subspecialty. There used to be a run through program. OK, that was trialled for three years. That is no longer available. So if you've heard from your colleagues that there is a run through program for ENT, uh, which you can apply for at the trainee level, but you can do all your years in one go, that no longer exists. There was only a couple of sites in the country, mainly in London and Manchester. Um, and um, unfortunately, those are no longer available, just to make you aware. OK, Romana, why don't you have a um, why don't we hear a bit more about you? And then I'll, I guess I'll talk more about myself in a minute. <laughs> so my slides have just have you got a slide up because it's just gone off my screen? Oh, has it? Yeah, I don't know if that's just my. Oh, that's it. It's back. It's back. I can okay. see it now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, as I said, I just graduated from X to uni. Um, and just moved to Pool to start as an F1 and had my first day today, as some of you might have done. Um, I've always been interested in surgery throughout medical school, being involved in the surgical society quite a bit. Um, and I was president this last year, which was a good opportunity. Um, and then it was sort of, yeah, halfway through medical school and my rotation in third year, I did a week of ENT and I just really enjoyed it. The team, it was in Cornwall actually, um, the team were really lovely and got me really involved. Um, the surgery that I went to see, it was all really interesting. Um, they sort of taught me through the head and neck anatomy a bit, which I hadn't really learned much about before. Um, so, and following on from that, I asked them if I could do a bit of research with them, find out a bit more about ENT, um, and then did a regional presentation with them from that. Um, and then I went on after my fourth year at Exeter, I did an intercalation in anatomy at Bristol, um, and I chose to do an ENT themed dissertation while I was there, um, and also sort of taught some anatomy um, while I was there as well, just to get some teaching experience. Um, and then I returned to Exeter for my final year, um, which is when I yeah, managed to do my six week ENT block, um, which I enjoyed even more than I had in third year. So that was a positive sign. Um, and that's when I applied to be an ENT UK rep. So if anyone is interested in that, I think I applied like November, December a year ago. So it will probably be coming up again, sort of end of 2022. Um, but that was a really good opportunity to get involved in ENT. Um, and yeah, I don't have any ENT placements this year, but in F2, my last job will be on ENT, a four-month ENT rotation then. So I'll hopefully 
sort of build up some more ENT things for my portfolio then um, and go on to apply for surgical training from there, really. Brilliant. And what Rowanna hasn't said is she's also presented some of her stuff uh, at national uh, international conferences, which is just ridiculous, really. I don't remember doing that uh, at your level. So uh, I was very impressed hearing about your, your stuff. Um, <laughs> Amazing, it really is. And um, caught the. I've worked with the Cornwall team; they're really friendly. And I think I'm working with a third year actually, who did some experience in Cornwall, and we're doing some research together, and we're trying to get a um, an article published and stuff. So um, that's a really good sort of story in how to get involved in some, you know, both some portfolio stuff. Yes, we have to do it for the portfolio, but also some stuff that actually you reflect on and go, "Wow, I had a really good time actually. I really enjoyed that. It was very." Filling. It was kind of a type two fun situation, but it was really enjoyable. And I've gained something from that and actually become more engaged in, in, uh, in a specialty. That's a great idea. I never really approached any seniors as a medical student to ask to do any research. I never really thought to do that. I didn't even know if I wanted to do ENT at that stage. There are points that you get only if you've done things at medical school, which are then closed to you when you're a doctor. Um, so if you're still a medical student, you can start now. You have uh, our permission to start now if you're interested um, and ask around to do these sorts of things. An intercalation as well is great. I also, uh, also did an intercalation and um, that's a really great year to sort of test the water. It takes some time out of the, the normal programme to give you an idea of whether you're interested in something particularly. Um, yeah, I found that really, really useful. I did mine up in Leeds. Um, and mine also was uh, studying advanced head and neck anatomy and neuroanatomy. So that also introduced me into ENT from that point of view. So an intercalation can be useful too to sort of test the water and gain something from it, you know, including on your portfolio, but also just life skills and, and, and interest. Um, OK, so from my point of view, uh, I was a, a student uh, at the University of Southampton Medical School in Wessex. Um, I gained, I think I did a, a week in fourth year is how it worked out for us. And then after that, I decided to intercalate in doing a, a BSc in clinical anatomy in Leeds. I picked Leeds because it's all dissection based. So we got to dissect lots of heads and necks um, and brains. And uh, I probably should have used that year better from a research point of view. Uh, they did give us a project um, and I dissected out the head and neck region to look at different surgical approaches to the threat to um, treating thoracic outlet syndrome, but never, never sort of sent it off to be published or, or anything like that. I didn't really know what I was doing. And um, I just thought, oh, no one's going to be interested in that. It's like a 10,000 word essay. So didn't really get round to that. Um, but it was a systematic review, a systematic review. And looking back at it now with my more surgical and portfolio minded brain, I would have gone, actually, we could have turned that into something. But the key is, is having a mentor and, and having guidance as well. You know, you're not expected to know everything straight away. And it is really good that you're here to, tonight. This is, you know, this is the, the best thing that you're doing. And it's also good to try and have a chat to colleagues above you to sort of get a bit of a mentor, a bit of advice about what you can and can't do. Because I'm still learning now about publishing stuff. Um, and certainly in medical school, that wasn't something I was thinking about. But the BSc in clinical anatomy got me really interested in ENT. I loved it. And then when I went back into fauna year, I did the four weeks in ENT. And by that point, I started to look at, you know, what what was required down the line. And I started sort of thinking about opportunities that I could take out there. And, and in final year, actually, I ended up doing a couple of competitions because I thought, right, I need to start doing stuff and I like surgery. Let's do it. And the competitions I did, there was one um, by the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, which you can be a member of and you can be a member of any of the colleges. It's fairly cheap for students and it gives you an example. Uh, and you can also, it's also cheap as foundation doctors. Um, you don't get points at the portfolio, but they introduce you to lots of information and prizes and competitions and events and things like that. I did the surgical skills competition, one regional winner for that in the Southampton region and did the final in Edinburgh which I didn't get, um, but it was a great experience and I got a regional prize for that. Um, I then also went to a summer school because I was feeling really nerdy that summer. And um, it was a international summer school and it was talk It's um, by, uh, I'll have to have a think about it at the end. Um, I forget who it was, but it was in Manchester. It was a paid for course. It was a whole week and you got to choose um, what sort of specialties you were interested in. And then loads of uh, doctors came to the conference and talked to you about these different specialties. So I thought, gosh, I need this to work out what I want to do. 
And then they sprung an international anatomy challenge uh, and people there from all around the world. And um, it just so happened I came second in that because I'd just done a year in clinical anatomy, you know, so it was all fortuitous. It wasn't like I planned to do that. Um, but then I could say I'm interview that I've done an international, I've won an international prize in second place, which does count. So you don't have to just be first, which is something I didn't realise. Anyway, I did foundation and I picked. Um, by this point, I was stuck on ENT. And so when I ranked all my jobs in foundation years, I picked one which had ENT in it. I hasten to add, though, as foundation doctors, if you're going, oh, I like ENT, but I haven't got an ENT job, don't panic, OK? To get into core training, you don't have to have any ENT experience. And I've just spoken to my um, core surgical trainee, year one guy who's taking over my job. He's done no ENT experience coming into an 18 month ENT job. So it's not a requirement. You can get into doing ENT, a core training, without any experience as a foundation doctor. What you do need is surgical experience. Anyway, so I'm going to move on. I know I'm chatting loads. Um, and, I'm, and I anticipate there's going to be lots of questions at the end. But I did my two years in F1 there. And I, I said, yeah, my advice is say yes to things. OK, just say yes to anything. Um, the, the photo on the top right here uh, with me and a couple of my uh, wonderful friends um, that is us on a TV show. We did a quiz. Uh, we did a show called Britain's Best Junior Doctors for the BBC. And uh, we were one of eight uh, teams that got through these sort of stages and got into the live rounds on live TV. Uh, not live TV, I lied, but it was on TV. <laughs> it was a couple of years ago. Um, you can't find any clips now if you're going to try and search for it. They're not available. Um, although I have got it on CD at home, of course. But uh, we did that and we came second overall in the country as, as pool host, representing Pool Hospital uh, with the cleverest F1s uh, in the region. Now, you don't have to do that, OK? And I was terrified saying yes to this opportunity. Um, but I said yes, nonetheless, driven by a fear that I wanted to get into ENT and I didn't know what else I wanted to do. And we ended up coming second. So you don't have to be this rearing ready to go surgeon since year one at medical school to, to get into this. But my advice is say yes to lots of things. Look out for these opportunities and try and take them and, and do with them what you can. That's one of Christian's life lessons. OK, so after that, um, I didn't want to go straight into core training. So I, I went to uh, New Zealand and I started working out there. OK, uh, traveled across America for four weeks, traveled across New Zealand, then worked out in there doing Obstengyne. Why, Christian, did you choose Obstengyne? Well, Obstengyne doesn't count as surgery. OK, doesn't count as surgical experience. Uh, and that was useful because there's only so much experience you can do in surgery before applying for core training. OK, which is 18 months. So make sure you look at that now. You don't want to exceed 18 months of surgical experience um, going into core training. If you do, then you can't apply. But Bob's and Gynae doesn't count. So I still wanted to do surgery. Um, but instead, I ended up doing the gynecology and C-sections and stuff like that. Still getting experience. Then COVID hit, had to come back early, had to cancel our wedding. That had to be delayed by a year. Um, I applied for core surgical training, didn't get in. Why is that? Well, the portfolio was OK. I got an interview, which in unto itself these days is actually a challenge. Um, but I had no one to practice with in New Zealand. No one knew what I was applying for. Um, I didn't really have any colleagues in the UK that I could sort of drop in on and do calls across the world to do interview practice. And I just, I just wasn't as prepared. And I, when I flew back to the UK, did the interview, uh, the management station particularly, which you don't need to worry about today, but the management station threw me a bit and I didn't get in, was absolutely gutted. First time I failed anything. Uh, that's not true. But first time that I felt like I wasn't going to uh, progress in life, you know, I was doomed. Um, and so what did I do instead? Well, my wife was going to uh, Cornwall, so I went to Cornwall and did an educational fellowship over there. And I educated students, teaching them anatomy, teaching them gen um, basic sciences. And I taught extra students, actually, in their second and third years and did practical skills with the final years. Um, and I got to do ENT, I got to do urology, got to do gen surgery, got lots of experience, built up my uh, logbook. And most importantly, I had people around me that were going for ENT and we practiced like hell to get through that interview. And the, the happy, you know, the happy ending is that I got a core surgical training job and I got it in ENT, um, which was my dream job. There's about 70 jobs in the country that have some ENT experience in them. So I ranked them all first based on geography, basically. And I got my second choice. So... And that sort of goes to show that you don't have to be, you know, awesome from day dot. You can learn as you go. Uh, say yes to everything as you go. 
and uh, overall you know if you look keen say yes to things try and get involved stay persistent you will get the job that you want to go into okay sorry that's a lot about me um and a lot about sort of anecdotal evidence and stuff i'm not that old but already i'm start talking about the old days and, and what i did so we'll go on to other things um i'm going to talk a little bit about getting into core surgical training because as you guys are medical students and f1 f2s this is something that you're going to be um approaching within the next couple of years and that amount of time is is key actually to develop your portfolio so that you have a good chance to get into core training um this is the uh the schedule that was last year and basically it runs in a similar format every year okay so uh, applications start around november you have to submit your portfolio around december you end up doing uh, finding out whether you get an interview in January, February time, and then you end up doing your interview in February to March time. That's that's roughly how it works over that schedule. And then after the interview, you find out if you've got a job in sort of March, April time. And by May, you get your results of your interview and you, you most people end up knowing where they're going to be. So again, that means that if you are an FI1 now, you've got about 18 months before you need to submit everything for um, going into course surgical training if you want to go straight through. So it gives you an idea that in 18 months, you know, that's, that's, what, that's what your goal is. I'm gonna go through a load of sort of data heavy slides, but I'm gonna try and breeze over it and give some anecdotal stories um, to sort of try and make it more interesting and, and demonstrate how you can do these things. Rowana, if there's any of these slides that you could particularly resonate with, can you just stop me and interrupt and, and say, oh, you know, I've got you know, a story about this, or this is how I, this is how I got um, points for this. I think that would be really useful as well. Um, so MRCS Part A. So these, this is the surgical exam that you get to do. Uh, there are two parts to it. Part A, everyone does. And um, part B, you only need to do part B of the normal MRCS exam um, when you're a core trainee. And there's a special one for ENT that you do separately to everyone else. But the MRCS part A, anyone who's interested in surgery does the part A. It's a written paper. If you pass it, now it used to be different. It used to be that if you just sat it, you get a point. But now you have to have passed it by December of F2 to have got the points. So I did it in, I think, January of F2 um so i didn't get it and i think the previous diet is october time so you're gonna to have to be pretty keen to already get points doing the mrcs if you're going straight through but that's it's it's worthwhile doing if you think e into uh, if you think surgery is something you want to go into uh courses there's loads and loads of different courses i've given a list here of courses that are particularly recognized and particularly useful for anyone interested in surgery uh, the basic surgical skills course is a great course that I wish I did in F1. Okay, I didn't do it till F4, um, basically for points. And by that point, I kind of knew the basic surgical skills because I'd just been in theatre enough. But um, at the at an F1 level, it'd be key. Really, really useful. It's it's a lot of money. I know you guys don't get study budgets in F1, and which is rough. Um, but it was a really good course to do in foundation training because. Uh, it teaches you all those things that you sort of are on the back foot on going into theatre. If you can suture, if you know how to repair wounds, make excisions, those sorts of things, you're going to, you know, excel going through if you do that course first. CRISP and ALERT, they're basically um, surgical versions of ALS courses. And ATLS is a trauma version of ALS, which is the advanced life support course, which everyone gets to do in their foundation training. There's other courses as well. I don't know whether there's any surgical specific courses apart from those that are as important, but those ones are the ones I would recommend. They're costly. If you can get it on the study budget, do and um, book early because a lot of other people are trying to get onto them because COVID has made it difficult um, to get onto these courses. Operative experience. So this is the thing that gets everyone interested. So if you're a medical student and you don't know if you want to do ENT, try and get some experience in theatre because that's, mo that's half the reason why everyone wants to do surgery okay they want to operate and operating and surgery is not about ward work it's not about i mean it is to a degree the clinics but you know being in theater and getting to like put some gloves on and actually do something that's when it gets your heart going that's when you get excited um, and that, that's something that i recommend in terms of points on the portfolio for that you basically just have to um, demonstrate that you have done um, a certain number of of uh, of 
cases um, assisting. So you can't be observing. So you can't be at the back of the room, not scrubbed. You have to be observing it. Um, but it's worth trying to get some assistance, get a, a senior colleague to show you how to do a little bit of suturing at the end, you know, closure of the wounds, that sort of thing. Um, and you'll get those points. Just do as many as you can. Start right away. You can even do it as a medical student. Um, how do you log this? Go to eLogbook, search it on Google and create an account today. Anyone can do it. I think I created it in Foundation Years because they needed a GMC number, actually. Um, so I don't know for medical students whether it's as accessible. But um, Rowana, if you haven't done it already, uh, create an eLogbook account um, as uh, along with everyone else who's in F1, F2 and start logging your cases straight away. I did it uh, from F1 and I got about 20 good cases and that was full marks for the interview. So, you know, that's all that was required. Um, it also says about surgical experience. This is slightly different. Um, I know we've talked about surgical cases, but it's also talking about um, how much elective time have you spent in a specialty? So I could say I could get full marks that because I did four weeks of added in the ENT. Uh, and that's something uh, that you guys can do too. So if you think you want to do surgery, still not sure yet, but you want to see what it's like, do that taster in some surgical specialty like ENT. You'll still get the marks for it. Okay, degrees and prizes. Well, with degrees, we're going to gloss over that. Basically, if you've done a uh, intercalated year, you get a point or two points, depending uh, on how well you did that year. If you've done a master's or a PhD, you guys probably already know that you get extra points. For the mass majority of us, we can't reach those higher um, points because doing a PhD or doing a master's requires a significant time out of training, uh, which that might be you. And a friend, a very good friend of mine is Dr. Doctor because she's a PhD student first and then a doctor, amazing girl. Um, but <clears throat> for the majority of us, that, that wouldn't apply. So I'll gloss over that. But consider an intercalated year if you are considering, you know, if, you, if you're not sure what to do. Um, there's no rush going through training. Hopefully I've demonstrated with my story that you don't have to go straight through everything if, you don't, if you're not in a rush. And an intercalated year was an amazing year. In fact, I would argue my best year was the intercalated year. <clears throat> prizes. Um, so prizes could be at medical school. If you're really, really clever at medical school, unlike me. Uh, you may be getting distinctions and things like that, and that gives you prizes already. If you're not as clever, if you're not in the top 10% uh, as the rest of the cohort, that's fine as well. You can do other prizes. Um, the SFO ENT has an undergraduate essay prize. The Royal College of Surgeons does a surgical skills prize. You can go to conferences that end up having prizes. You can do other essay prizes. There's loads and loads of availability out there. You just kind of have to look for it and go into it. Oh, another one I'll advertise. The neurosurgery um, competition, the National Undergraduate Neurosurgical Competition, which I used to I write the paper for, um, that's in Southampton, and that's a national prize as well. And you get, you don't have to come top either. If you come in the top 10%, you get a prize as well. So if you are particularly good at your neuroanatomy, uh, that could be something you want to do as well. But the real moral of the story there is say yes, give it a go. There's not often loads of people that actually go into these things, and you'd be surprised what you could win. Quality improvement, audits. This is bread and butter. It's expected that everyone basically gets these points and it's not too difficult to get. Um, what is an audit? What is quality improvement? Well, I'm not going to go into that in detail because that's an interview answer question, uh, which you learn for interview and then you forget immediately afterwards. But basically, uh, as medical students, if you're not aware of what a quality improvement is for an audit, um, it's basically where you um, measure current practice against a standard, that's with an audit, and then you see how well you do against the standard. Uh, if you're not doing well against the standard, you put in an implementation and then you re-audit to see whether your implementations made a difference compared to the standard. And a quality improvement project is basically the same thing, but you don't have a, a national or local standard to compare it against. So you're just comparing it against sort of anecdotal evidence of the fact that maybe something isn't going well and you want to try and improve that, but you haven't got something to a standard to compare that with. Um, most F1, F2s, I believe, have to complete one of these during their training. So I was forced to do one of, one of these in F1, F2. And Pool Hospital is actually very good at supporting you through that whole process. So even though I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, and I did a quality improvement on, I think, urine dipstick recording, which is not the most cutting edge or thrilling of, of audits or of quality improvements. But as a result of that, I could demonstrate that I led... Uh, all aspects of the surgical themed clinical audit, which is the top points there. And I presented it at the um, local meeting because we all had to present it at the local meeting to pass F1. 
Um, but that actually, in you know, without really realizing it, gave me top points for that. So just make sure that you are involved in all aspects of a quality improvement project. Make sure it's surgically themed. They've changed that now. So make sure you do one with surgery. I wouldn't have got through with my urine dip one. Um, and also make sure that you present it as something. It's very easy, actually, to present um, orders and quality improvement. I did one earlier today. I didn't think it was even going to get in, but I submitted an abstract. I thought it was a bit naff and they accepted it. And I did it earlier today. And that was a regional presentation. So don't be afraid to um, get stuck into these audits and quality improvement. You don't have to do it alone. You can do it with other people. You all benefit as a result of that because it's a lot of work to do on your own. Don't do it on your own. Do it with other people and then look around to see at what sort of undergraduate conferences uh, or postgraduate foundation conferences you can do. My top tip for foundation doctors, definitely, definitely, definitely put something into the foundation um, national conference in Bristol. OK, that's in uh, January, I think, uh, each year. And they pretty much accept anything. It's only for foundation doctors. So you've already got a smaller group to apply and they have so much capacity that they'll accept anything. I did a poster um, and, and, and it, was a it was a national poster, technically. So that gives me top points for a poster. Easy peasy. Teaching experience and training. Uh, Rowena, why don't you have a chat about teaching experience? Because you did a bit of that uh, with your intercalated year. Yeah, so I think um, I first saw this sort of structure actually during my intercalation year. I saw this portfolio thing um, and I thought, oh, I've got a bit of time this year compared to some like med student years. Um, and I thought, I'm learning a lot of maths and I've been trying to sort of pass it on to the younger years. So because you do a lot of your learning at medical school of anatomy in the first and second years, I sort of um, got together with some groups of first years, I think it was, and just sort of ran through a lot of their like upper limb anatomy, neuroanatomy, etc. Um, and yeah, it's re it's really good for your portfolio. You can get sort of feedback forms um, and things from them. Um, and it actually was quite helpful. Some of the sort of topics I did in detail with them actually came up in my anatomy exams. Anyway, so it's it's the kind of thing people don't like to take time out to do um, when they're busy, but like actually teaching a subject can really help you on your course anyway. So I would def definitely really recommend um, teaching. Out of all of the things on the portfolio, I'd say teaching is quite an easy one you can do because um, there's always going to be younger students that are going to want to come along um, to sort of anything you can make, like ENT for finals, like anything like that. Um, I'd say that students will always be keen for. So, yeah, I definitely recommend that. Exactly, just as Rowena said. And I'll just add a couple of finicky details to that as well for the actual portfolio. Um, it's What's really annoying is that they're very particular. And so you have to really read the small print here. So I did that year in Truro doing a, an education fellow where I taught sessions every week i'm sure Rana did this as well but i taught sessions every week um for the whole year and i was basically part of the exeter teaching syllabus so i felt you know you know like i was doing a really good job and this was going to be amazing i was going to get top marks i didn't get top marks why um because i technically didn't work with local educators to design the teaching program i organized it but they didn't give me the points because I didn't design it because it was part of the university's standard curriculum. The university designed it and I provided and organized it. And that was enough for them not to give me those top points. So do read the small print. You will get caught out otherwise. So you have to demonstrate that you've basically spoken to someone senior, ideally a consultant, um, and said, I want to create this teaching program. You only have to do four sessions a year. It's not that many. It used to be that you had to do regular sessions for six months, uh, but it had to be more regular than that. So four sessions over a year, um, but you have to have a senior back you up and say, you designed all of this and they kind of supervised you doing it. So make sure you do that. Um, and then you have to have evidence of formal feedback. Feedback, 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 really, really important. I overloaded my portfolio with the feedback stuff just to make sure, I mean, I didn't, probably didn't need to, we're getting feedback from this from you guys as well as today. So even now it's important. Um, any teaching that you do, always design feedback. It doesn't take very long. You can do something like Survey Monkey or a physical uh, feedback form if you're old school and the, and the participants are in with you in the room. And um, the if you haven't done feedback, uh, then it didn't exist.
It's as simple as that. So make sure you get your feedback, make sure you can demonstrate you've designed it yourself with the supervisor to say, yes, very well done. You're doing an excellent job. Um, and also make sure that you do regular sessions throughout the year. If you do that, and that's not that difficult, once you now know that that's what you have to do, you'll get full marks. Training and teaching. Training and teaching is a bit of a funny one. You've basically either done it or you haven't. Um, and they're really picky about this. If you want to do an FY3 year and you want some extra points both in teaching and in training and teaching, then you could do an educational fellow year that also pays for you to do a PG certificate, postgraduate certificate in medical education. One of my colleagues did that. She got three points of this automatically for doing that over the year. And she also designed um, a teaching schedule over the year as well with her educational supervisor. So she got full, well, almost full marks here. Um, again, if you've been, not many people will have a master's level qualification, so I'll just skip that. Um, I thought I had done training and teaching, but actually I'd only had training and teaching that lasted less than two days or was two days. That includes the training and teachers course, which is something which is worth doing. If you're not going to do anything else, try and get on the training the teachers course. Um, but uh, I wasn't able to get any more points than one point because of that. Uh, but if you can demonstrate that you've done five days of training in teaching, then you get points. And actually, there are courses out there that have looked at this portfolio and just gone, right, we'll just add an extra couple of days so that it applies. And my colleagues who did those courses did get through. So there's a bit about being savvy about it as well. Presentations. Well, presentations, basically any work that you do, this is what I've been told, and I'm not always amazing at doing this myself, but this is what I've been told. Any work that you do, uh, let's say you do an audit, okay? Uh, I'll give you an example. Okay, let's have, uh, today I presented a tonsillitis audit. So let's say we do an audit on tonsillitis, okay? So how do we manage tonsillitis in the acute setting compared to national guidelines? So I audit that, um, I do two cycles, um, and I demonstrate that I've done all the work and I present it at my local departmental meeting. Full marks to audit. Then I submit it to a regional ENT conference, uh, which uh, anyone can do, including med students. That gets accepted. Um, I do a poster on that and I present it as a poster. Then I get marks of the poster. Um, maybe this is a particular project that's quite interesting and I start writing an abstract and an article to get it published, send the abstract off to a journal, uh, which accepts it. I then also get a publication as a result of it. For one piece of work, I've managed to get points in all sorts of different areas. It's the same with presentations. Presentations come into three forms, basically. Local or departmental, regional, national or international. Um, like I say, apply for the Foundation Training National Conference. Easy to get into, gives you maximum points. If you can do an oral presentation there, you get more points. If you can do a poster, you get less points, but still worthwhile. And this is basically that, but divided up in different categories. If you can do an oral presentation at a national meeting, full marks. If you can do a couple of posters where you've been the primary author, and let's be honest, if you've worked just as hard as someone else on doing a poster, but you just switch the number names around for first author when you present it, then you'll get the points, but you'll get those points there. So that's fine as well. Um, and it goes down as such. Uh, there's a couple of examples of where you could send these through that are ENT related. It doesn't even have to be ENT related though. You can just do um, general surgical conferences, um, ASSET is a good example of a general surgical conference. There's regional meetings, there's national, international meetings, all sorts. All you have to do basically is look for it and go for it. Okay, we're, we're coming to the end of this, guys, and I realise this is quite heavy. I know we've got 10 minutes left and I do want to answer your questions. Um, but if anyone is finding that this is kind of starting to become irrelevant and you want me to speed through the last bit so we can answer your questions about ENT, just let me know in the chat. I'll happily skim over the last few bits. Um, but I'll crack on it nonetheless. Publications, so publications are hard to get. I currently don't have any publications. I've got three or four in the pipeline, but they're really hard to sort of go through. And there may be some of you, I'm sure here, have already gone, oh, I've already got a publication or two or three. Uh, and I bow down to you and I would love to hear your experience of that. Uh, but you don't have to have publications to get to my stage. Um, uh, but they are something that you do have to sort of go into and submit and, and, um, and think about doing because they do take a long time to go from the idea and conception to fully published in a journal. That being said, you have to just demonstrate that it's been accepted in the journal to get the marks, not actually have it published in the journal. OK, so you do have a sh uh, more time than you think. 
Um, and this is basically saying, are you a first author? Are you a co-author? Um, or have you been involved in uh, a collaborative effort to do publications? And you can find these at different stages. Now, if you're interested um, about trying to get some collaborative authorship, which is the easiest way of getting into publications, and you particularly want to do it in ENT, there is a site called Integrate, which is what I use quite a lot to get collaborative work uh, research uh, publications in ENT, because it's a group of ENT uh, registrars that put out different national um, sort of audits or research proposals that then departments will um, take up if there's someone interested in taking it up and do the work and submit it to them. And then down the line, they'll publish that. And because you've been involved with it, with the, with the local data collection, you'll get your name as a collaborator on the publication. So that's something that's worth doing if you want to dip your toe into publications, but you're not sure about doing something yourself. That being said, like I said, there's a colleague of mine who's a third year medical student in Truro who just asked a consultant, I want to be involved in research. And I said the same thing to the consultant. He said, well, I've got this project. Won't you do that? And now we're at the other end of it, looking at, publish, um, at, at, at um, publishing that. So asking around um, for projects is absolutely acceptable. And if there's a surgeon or someone who's actually um, keen and interested, um, then you know they will help you and mentor you and get you that publication down the line. But it takes a long time. Don't worry if it takes a year or two. Okay, you just need to sort of start doing it now. Um, have it in the back of your mind, but don't stress about it. Leadership. Leadership's a really fun one. I. You know, I didn't go into leadership stuff um, on my own sort of fruition on it necessarily. I kind of did it partly to, to tick the boxes for the portfolio. But now looking back retrospectively, I've had the most fun being involved in all these societies and meeting people that are passionate about things that I'm passionate about. Um, and it's been the most fun. Uh, a good example is, you know, being part of the mess. I was the social sec for pool. I got to organise the water sports for the pool mess society. Brilliant, really fun. Um, I've been a uh, exam writer for a national undergraduate neuroanatomy competition. That was really fun, really interesting, a different experience. I was um, the teaching coordinator for my academic society at university. That was really fun just to sort of get to know people and develop some, some teaching and that sort of thing. Uh, and I'm part of SFO, as is Rowana, um, part of the committee. And I'm doing this talk to you guys, basically, because, you know, I saw something on Facebook from Mind the Bleep saying, hey, do you want to talk about your specialty if you like it? And I thought, oh, I like my specialty and I'll do a talk on it. You know, so uh, it's actually something that's quite enjoyable to do. Um, ideally, you want to aim for something that is sort of regional, but but you know, or national. But it's very easy to get something local. You know, you can be part of your own committee at your university, or you can be part of your mess if you want to, or you can be. I was also the um, the chair of the uh, Guardians of Safe Working Hours Committee. Um, so we used to talk about how to accept a report and. Uh, if you're not aware of what that is yet, don't worry. But basically, we have support other junior doctors report when they were overworking uh, but not being paid for it. And I was the junior doctor chair for that, so I ended up hosting those meetings. And that, then, you know, that was another local leadership thing. So it's very, you know, if you look for it, if you say yes, um, you actually can end up falling into lots of fun different roles. And as a result of that, you'll probably have an enriched. Um, sort of experience in life really you can tell maybe that I'm quite passionate and, and I've really enjoyed my time doing these experiences and I never set out going into medical school thinking I would do all of this say yes give it a go um, and yeah and the roles in leadership are probably the most enjoyable that I've that I've that I've gone through okay this is a fun one so guys if you are an F1 and you don't want to run through straight into a core surgical training or you have F2 and you probably at this stage if you're an F2 you just finished haven't you? or you just started um, and you're thinking I don't want to go straight into core training oh but won't surgery like uh, discriminate me for that no they won't and they won't discriminate you if you apply for uh, surgical training in F1 and you don't get in uh, and then you go again the next year okay so my advice would be do you want to go into surgery yes I do I quite you know want to give it a go um, my portfolio is up to scratch, uh, could be better, but I'll give it a go. Do give it a go. If you get an interview, you don't get in, like me first time, it doesn't matter, okay? You can do another year out. You've gained that crucial experience of, in, of interviewing already. You know what to expect next time. 
And then the next time round, it's so much less stressful and you know exactly what you need to do. So uh, my advice is, you know, if you're thinking about surgery, do apply for it, do go for it. If you don't get in first time round, do consider doing it again. But what could you do in FY3? Well, you could be an anatomy demonstrator like Rowana was in an intercalated year. You could do what I did, which was being an educational fellow. Make sure that you get one of the extra perks, okay? You want time off to be able to do those educational um, roles or academic roles. Don't do a job which is 100% and they don't give you any time to do those extra roles but still expect you to do it, okay? You need something like 50-50 or 80-20, which is what I had. Uh, junior clinical fellow, this is a very popular thing to do, right? Because especially with COVID, people couldn't travel abroad so much and work abroad, so they found jobs in the UK. There are tons of them. And if you want a year uh, out in the countryside, you want to learn how to surf, may I recommend Cornwall, which is where I did mine. They've got 43 or 44 clinical fellow jobs down there, and you can just spend a year there and have the best time of your life and also gain some academic experience. But of course, you can do that any in the country. One of my um, colleagues uh, made very good use of it and went to London for a year to do ENT there and got a load of publications as a result of that. So that's another good example as well. Additional degrees, probably the most useful at your stage is either an intercalated degree, a postgraduate degree in education, something like that, uh, that you can do just for a year. You can actually do a master's if you do it full time for a year, but then you're going to have to start thinking about how you're going to fund it as well. Um, but an option for that F2s is you could locum um, and then do your master's, which is only like two days a week. So if you work two days a week doing your master's and then locum um, other, day, other shifts, uh, to keep up you know, enough money so that you can survive and get by, uh, you will end up with a master's great experience and having locum for a year. So food for thought. We could talk about that more if you guys want to talk about that. Um, but my message there is don't be afraid if you want to do it. Don't feel rushed into things. Do make sure that you have some sort of plan in that year, though. Don't have it as a complete dossier without doing anything because um, that's a missed opportunity. Um, but do feel free to branch out and, and take your time and do things to get experience, get points and apply again. OK, this slide at the end, this is just some useful links. Um, I'm sure we can share these slides to you guys um, where you can find this. These are all useful documents that I've um, uh, used to try and look at careers in ENT. And um, I found it very helpful in giving me an idea about whether ENT is what I want to do, how to get into it and, and where to take it. And that is it. That is, I'm sorry that it was a whole hour just talking um, to you guys. I hope that was useful. It was slightly more heavy on the how to get into core training because, um, you know, there's a lot of detail there and a lot of people will be looking at how to get into core training. So uh, we'll open up to the floor now and uh, Frankie will hopefully help us um, hear about your questions. But if you have more if you have more questions about ENT as opposed to specifically getting into surgery, we'll, we'll do that. But you know, whatever you want, we can have a chat about that. I'd be very happy. Thank you so much, guys. That was um, that was so so interesting and comprehensive. I feel like I have so many questions just for myself. Um, we haven't got any on the chat just at the moment. I have encouraged people to put any if they they have any. Um, but to be honest, you did do very good explanation, so maybe that's why. <laughs> Um, would it be helpful to talk through the average day of an SHO ENT doctor? Would that be interesting? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah? Okay. Um, I'll do that. And, and if you guys have questions, please just um, send them through now. Uh, but an average day is in, uh, as an SHO doctor, we'll talk about that first and we can then go up to consultant stuff. But as an SHO, uh, you get in at eight because surgeons like to get in at eight, not before. OK, uh, we like to start early. Why, you ask? Well, that's because we have to start theatre. And um, so that's why we all have to get in early. Um, but we get in at eight o'clock. We do the ward round between eight and nine, hopefully finish by nine. OK, ENT is a quick specialty, as is most of surgery most surgeries at doing the ward rounds and then we're done by nine and then as an SHO you're either on call for the day and ENT depending on where you work may be varied but there's opportunities either to do it as a resident or non-residential so currently I'm working non-resident where I have a 24-hour on call shift but after basically 9.30 it's unlikely I get called in. I do sometimes, I don't always, I'm allowed to go home, I have the mobile on me and um, and they get called back. So, but I'm on call for that day. So if you're the person on call, you may spend the day being on call. 
and you get called about anyone that comes into A and E or the surgical receiving unit uh, with uh, an ENT problem, and that might be your date. But if you're not on call, then you could be either running an emergency ENT clinic. This is one of the amazing things with ENT is uh, when you, you it tends to be a job you do in F two, which is good actually because. F1, you're just trying to find your feet and learn what on earth is being a doctor. By F2, you start to sort of develop a bit of understanding of what you're doing. You start to develop a bit of your own practice. And then um, the emergency clinics in ENT give you the autonomy to start doing things yourself. You get to learn lots of practical skills like microsuctioning, manage epistaxis, which are nosebleeds, um, taking foreign bodies out of ears and noses. Um, resetting broken noses, all sorts. You get to do these things and they make a real difference and you feel like an absolute god among men and women, you know, because you can actually do something and make someone better. Um, and that can feel really good as well. And you start to feel like you're a proper doctor. So you might do that for half a day. And the other half a day, if you're not doing clinic and you're not on call, then you're not actually expected in most places to, to be doing anything, you know, so you have this free time. Now, that free time is usually set for you to either attend consultant or reg clinics or go to theatre. So how many jobs on the daily or on the regular do you get to have, you know, daily or, or every other day um, planned experience to go and do clinical or go to theatre? You know, not, not loads. You know, when you're a general surgical uh, admin monkey in, in, uh, as an FY1, which is what I was, um, I learned a lot of skills, but it was harder to get into theatre, and I definitely didn't see many consultant general surgical clinics. But with ENT, that does tend to be more available because because the job is generally, I suppose, maybe less busy, um, or it requires less people on call to be able to manage it. And there's less ward work, you know? Um, it, it, obviously, in big trusts, it's going to be different. If you're in London, it's obviously going to be different compared to if you're in pool, for example. But in pool... I would say if you've got more than seven or eight patients on your ward list, then it's a busy day. And that's not bad, is it? When we compare against general surgery, which would be 20 patients or more. So uh, that's sort of the standard day. In some trusts, ENT finishes early, guys. You can finish at four o'clock or 4.30. I think in Paul it was 4.30. In Truro it was four o'clock. Unfortunately, in Plymouth, where I'm about to go to, it's 5.30, which is the other end of the spectrum. But um, yeah, sometimes you finish early as well. But hopefully that gives you an idea as an SHO what, what your sort of experience is. As you progress to a registrar, then you don't run the e-clinics, the emergency clinics, but you start running registrar clinics that are joined as an adjunct to consultant clinics. And then you can talk to the consultants about the patients and ask for advice and things like that. And you get more dedicated time in theatre. You should have at least three to four sessions of theatre a week. A session is a half day, so you should have three to four half days a week. I say two and a bit days of, of pure surgical experience and you rotate around different subspecialties. So you might be the head and neck registrar and you do all the head and neck with, your, with the head and neck surgeon around the week or you're the otology or the rhinology registrar and you follow them. Uh, the on calls as a registrar tends to be less intense than an SHO. Actually, because of my experience, I have been on the registrar rates for ENT for the last five months. Um, a mixture of they wanted to give me the opportunity and they thought I'd be good at it and also COVID meant there was no one else to do it so please could you do it um, but that was a really good experience and the intensity has been less generally speaking um, and uh, I've actually been covering two hospitals Exeter and Torbay so that can happen as well so that's what it's like as a registrar and over those years from what year three to year six uh, in year seven, year eight, you start to sort of decide what you want to go into. And by year eight, you'll have done your other exam, the consultant exams, and you'll be starting to look at doing a fellowship, which means uh, you don't have to, but most people do. Um, a fellowship is where you then do an extra year, either in the UK or abroad, in your subspecialty of ENT to demonstrate an interview for a consultant job that you've got more experience than other people in that subspecialty. And then as a consultant, I'm sure it's all golf and, and uh, surgery, but uh, I'm sure it's not. But, um, uh, you know, that sort of gives you an idea as an SHO, you know, what your day will be like. And then going into a, a registrar, what your time will be like as well, because I had a bit of experience with both. Brilliant. Great. Could I ask a question, Christian? Um, so when you yeah, touched on the MRCS and 
there being, I'd seen before about there being a Part B for ENT, and then like a general Part B. If you want to do ENT, are you better yeah. off doing the special ENT one, or can you do the like generic Part B? I'm not really, just not really sure how it works. Sure. Um, and I'll add in info about Part A as well, because that's just changed this year. So uh, Part A, you do, everyone does that wants to do surgery. It used to be that you could do a diploma in otolaryngology called DONS Part A, and that was an ENT only um, multiple choice paper. And then you could do DONS Part B, which is the diploma of ENT basically. And that's the MRCS Part B that you're talking about in ENT. They've now scrapped the DONS Part A. So if you thought that you could do an ENT paper Part A and then an ENT paper Part B, that's now incorrect from this year. Uh, so everyone does the MRCS Part A. Once you pass that, you do Part B. If you do the standard Part B, then you're going to get questions about all other surgical specialties. And uh, it means that if you pass that, then you can apply for all the other surgical specialties. Uh, so if you're not sure if ENT is definitely the one for you, or you're not sure if you're going to get into ENT and you would be happy to go for something else, you could decide to do the MRCS Part B. But unfortunately, they don't cross over. So if you did the MRCS Part B, not ENT, and went for ENT, they wouldn't accept that. Equally, if you did the MRCS Part B for ENT and then tried to go into another surgical specialty, they wouldn't accept that. So you have to do both papers, which people do do, but you have to do both papers to be able to get both things. Thank you. And weirdly, the MRCS Part B, sorry, but weirdly, the MRCS Part B, you think it's all practical stuff, but there's actually a lot of ENT theory in that as well. Okay. So, because I've heard for the, sorry, I was just going to say the Part A, it's more like um, medical school kind of thing, isn't it? And then Part B is a bit more, you don't want a bit more maybe clinical experience for that. And do that slightly later. Yeah, a part A is like doing finals again in terms of the physiology, the anatomy, the pathology, but then it throws in some more surgical related stuff like, so, you know, what is this, not, not what is the cyst trunks procedure, but, you know, how do you manage this patient? Oh, I do a cyst trunks procedure. Well, I've never heard of that before going in and learning about it. So there is some surgical specific stuff that they talk about as well. Uh, but yes, I think that when people struggle to get through part A, it's usually by the downfall of not doing enough revision for physiology or anatomy. Is it, um, is it absolutely necessary to have done the MRCS part A to get into CFT? No, no, it just gives you an extra four points. Um, now, I don't know if you're that interested in points data itself, but um, uh, I think last year, the number of points to get in was 37 was the cutoff, uh, which is pretty high. So if you were on 30, you know, three points and you just needed that four more to get in or whatever, you know, then that makes a big difference. And, then, and let everyone, you can look at the portfolio requirements and you can see that actually everyone gets kind of similar points. And then people break away with publications or presentations or extra degrees. And so a lot of people, and also a lot of people didn't get in the previous year and uh, taken a year out and gone again so a lot of people if you can do the MSS part a basically do do it because there will be a lot of people that have done it and then, but not by no means have they because one of my friends has only just passed it and another friend just passed it as well you have to it's basically compulsory to have passed it by the end of ct1 core training year one but even then they'll so support you, you any uh, if you don't yeah Exactly. Yeah, you have to do it at some point anyway. Some people say the sooner you do it after medical school, the better, because you've kind of learned that stuff anyway, to a degree. Sorry, carry on. There's a bit of a lag. <laughs> no, no, I was just, no, no, that's fine. I was just saying that, uh, that, you know, having done medical school, you've just come out of it, you've done finals, you've got a lot of the information that you can then take on to MRCS Part A. And also, you're still in that kind of mindset of I know what it's you, I know what to do, like revising. I'm kind of used to that. Um, once you're a doctor and you're being paid and you have a natural normal life to a degree, um, it can be hard, I think, to get back into that kind of exam treadmill. And it feels more novel as well. It feels odd going from, you know, no longer do I have to work in the evenings on a standard day because I don't have to revise or, you know, all that stuff at medical school. 
Um, trying to go from that back into I've got to spend the evenings revising is a bit hard. So maybe you could argue doing it sooner is also good from your mental point of view. How much in advance do you need to book it if you want to sit it, you know, whenever you want to sit it? Uh, they have a deadline for applications. Um, I think of late it's back in back face to face now as well. Um, I don't I haven't heard many people saying that they've been struggling to get a place to do it. It's not like you run out of places per se. Um, but there have been a couple of cancellations in COVID and they were trying it on, on, online as well. Um, but I think it was back to face to face. And um, yeah. uh, usually if you apply for it by the deadline, you'll get a place. That being said, you do also want to kind of mentally be in the zone that you're going to go for this exam. And that can be hard to, to get your head around as well, because once you put that money down, you've committed and um you know you also want to give yourself a good amount of time to be able to revise you know how to revise frankly like you, you've done it already you've gone to university you've passed everything um so you do know what to do to revise for an mcq paper just make sure you give yourself enough time to be able to go through that rigmarole of doing it Well, um, sorry for keeping, um, it was a really good talk. Thank you so much for doing it all, taking part as well. Make sure you put in the chat files and you can get your certificates and do there and do the feedback forms. That's everything. Brilliant. Frank is doing a slight robot impression, but I think she's rounding things up and saying thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope that was useful. Let us know in the feedback if we can change things in any way. Uh, do consider joining Mind the Bleak. Do consider joining SFO, ENT, and I, I hope to be working with you guys in ENT in the future. All right. Take care. Uh, I think that's it. We'll round things up. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.